there, everybody. We are in this book, The Landmark History of the American People. But you don't have that book. You have photocopies of it in this assignment. So I'd like you, we are going to be reading through part one, chapter one today. And so you will find that in the papers for this section. Um, I'm also going to read the prologue to this book today. Okay. So I'm going to read the prologue first, and you should have a copy of that. And then I'm going to read part one and chapter one. And um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But this is our American literature. So... After the American Revolution, the United States grew and changed in remarkable ways. The newly formed federal government acquired lands from Britain, France, and Spain. Okay, so let's remember what the American Revolution was, okay? So we've got Americans have come over to the United States and they have fought Britain to be our own country, all right? So that's where we are right now. We, were, we fought for our own country. And now we are getting, we have a new federal government and we're starting to get lands that previously other people like France and Spain had owned. Um, you'll see this because even in like Louisiana, there's a lot of French names on things. And that's because the French originally owned a lot of the area of Louisiana, which with the Louisiana territory that we'll learn more about. By 1848, its territory spanned the North American continent. These territories opened up all kinds of opportunities for go-getters. People who dreamed of forging new lives, developing new communities, fostering new businesses, creating new inventions, and living in radically new ways never seen before. Everyday life for Americans changed more in the few decades of the late 1800s than their ancestors' lives had changed in the thousand years before. And that's actually a really important thing to understand. Um, the late 1800s as the Industrial Revolution came in, okay? So the Industrial Revolution is something that's really important to understand. Prior to the, and the Industrial Revolution is when factories and all kinds of places of business open. Before factories opened, okay, which is the Industrial Revolution, before factories opened, if a, um, if a, if a family would live on a farm, okay, and the dad would work the farm and that's the food they would eat. And the mom would sew a quilt and she would sell it to the neighbor or trade it to the neighbor for some milk. And they would work within their community on the farm together as a family. But when the Industrial Revolution happened, picture this. Now there's a factory down the road that makes quilts, okay? And they can make quilts way faster than that woman could sew them and cheaper. So no one buys her quilts anymore. So now her family doesn't have any extra money. So guess what happens? the husband decides to go get a job at that factory. And now he's leaving the home and he's going to the factory to have a job. And now the woman has to end up picking up some of the farm chores and doing this. So all of a sudden our world is gonna really, really, really be changing. Where in the previous 1000 years before all that happened, things were relatively the same. You know, we had some inventions, right? But generally like, like um, electricity and stuff, but generally speaking, things were kind of the same. People did the same things with their families. And now all of a sudden we're gonna have big changes. So everyday life for Americans changed more in the few decades of the late 1800s than their ancestors' lives had changed in the thousand years before. These changes did not come without a cost, however. Political conflicts between North and South cracked the Union in two and led to a deadly civil war. The war itself led to black slaves being freed in 1865 and black men were allowed to vote in 1870. Despite these advances, it would be almost another hundred years before the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which my parents were alive in 1964, mandated equal treatment under the law for both men and women of all races in the United States. So even though we had the war that ended slavery, it was another hundred years before blacks and whites would be given equal rights under the law. And that means like um, able to eat in the same restaurants, able to same, use the same bathrooms, able to attend the same schools. Um, there was a, a saying prior to that, separate but equal, 
So we're going to keep everybody separate, but we're going to offer, offer equal things. But that actually wasn't the case. Schools weren't necessarily as good for the black students as they were for the white students. Meanwhile, the Civil War also led to a stronger centralized government than ever, as the legislative decisions referenced before the war as emanating from the plural, these United States came to be referenced after the war as emanating from the singular, the United States. So before the Civil War, we were these United States. So we were all these different states, but now we're the United States. Technical changes too pulled the separate states and their, their diverse populations together. Standardized railroad gauges made all railroad tracks easy to connect and strengthened the bonds between North and South following the Civil War. So now we've got railroad tracks so people can move between the states easier. Standardized measurements, new mass production technologies, high-speed methods of transportation meant people, in, even in small towns, were able to buy ready-made goods like clothing, tools, even houses at fantastically reduced prices compared to what they had been. Standardized time zones also brought people together. So all these things are starting. Inventors created devices that help people in all areas of their lives, particularly in communication and travel. Merchants increased sales by sending mail-ordered catalogs to customers everywhere within the country, and tremendous department stores catered to the needs and whims of all kinds of customers. This lasted for a long time. In fact, when I was a kid, you know, because I grew up without a computer in my house my whole life, I didn't get emailed till I was 21 or 20 maybe. So when I was a kid, the greatest thing that would come in the mail was like the JCPenney catalog. And it'd be this huge catalog that you could look through and pick the things you wanted to buy. Um, and that was sort of how you like shopped, not in the store at that age or in that era. Um, businessmen saw opportunities to become incredibly wealthy. They began small venues, ventures in cattle, oil, automobile manufacture, and other industries and soon found themselves at the head of gigantic companies. These companies attracted immigrants from all over the world who sought the promise of a better life. And these new citizens changed towns into cities and cities into metropolises, right? Because as more people come, a small town becomes a bigger town, becomes a city, and then a metropolis is sort of like a big, big city. As a result of its newfound wealth, consolidated power, and growing population, the United States soon found itself being viewed as a leader on the international stage. So now we're sort of a world power. At that point, we weren't even, I mean, all these other countries existed. We didn't even exist. Eventually, the United States' leadership moved even beyond the earth as Americans accomplished the impossible and became the first and only humans to ever walk on the surface of the moon. And from there... It appeared as if the United States would go anywhere its citizens' go-getting spirit might direct their attention. Okay, so now we're going to go back in time and sort of, that's the prologue. That's what we're going to learn about. And we're going to kind of go back in time now to um, before the, um, back into the 1800s, etc. in part one. So we have this picture here that I sent you. So go ahead and open that up on your computer screen. If you chose not to print it, that's fine. But go ahead and open that up, okay? Um, and this says, underneath the picture, the United States had always experienced regional differences. For the first 80 years it existed, few if any people would have thought of the United States as a country. Your state was your country. The United States was simply a legal structure that let the different member countries or states work out their differences and cooperate on matters that were of concern to all of them together. However, in 1860, differences between the member countries or states grew so big that they wound up fighting each other in what has now become known as the Civil War. States in the North retained the name the United States and those were the Union soldiers. States in the South agreed to fight together as the Confederate States. And that's where we get our Confederate flag from. Um, originally, that was not a flag of, you know, nowadays it has some racial tones to it. it. It was a flag that symbolized the South, who, amongst other things, were fighting to keep slavery. So you've got the South fighting with the North. And the North is the Union. And the South are the Confederates. Um, states in the North retained the name the United States. States in the South agreed to fight together as the Confederate States. 
So then we have a picture here of soldiers from the Northern States. They're the ones wearing the blue uniforms, fighting soldiers from the South wearing the gray uniforms. And you have to remember too that just because you lived in the South didn't mean you necessarily agreed with what the South was doing or vice versa. Ended up that where you were living, that's where you were fighting. Um, although there were some people who crossed and fought for the other sides. So now I'm on what is actually gonna be page, I don't even know if these actually have page numbers. I guess it would be the equivalent of page one. Part one, the Rocky Road to Union. And that's this page. So open up this page. I really want you to be following along while I'm reading. So you're getting to do both. It's good for your brain to do both. The United States spread across the continent, but the nation did not grow all in the same way or at the same place. Some cities, Chicago, Omaha, Denver, and San Francisco, so San Francisco grew fast and prospered. Others were left behind and they became ghost towns. And what is a ghost town? I think you guys have probably seen these before. Those are towns that like, there's no people left in them. So it's just all the stuff is still there and there's no people. Um, and still others disappeared without a trace. Some people dreamed of gold and found it. Others found only rocks and disappointment. Some tried to raise crops that the soil would not feed or where the rain did not come. By the mid 1800s, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia had universities, libraries, and museums. Charleston in New Orleans boasted elegant townhouses. Virginia had its old planters mansions, but life in these cities was nothing like life in crude mining camps like Dead Man's Gulch, Colorado, and Virginia City, Nevada. The differences were like those between life in Great Britain and life in the American colonies 100 years before. The Republic of Texas was a completely separate nation from 1836 to 1845. California too was briefly independent. The lonely wheat farmer or cattleman of the Great Plains in Nebraska or Iowa was well aware of how different his life was compared to the lively crowds of Pittsburgh, Chicago, Milwaukee, or Omaha. There were many different American ways. Could the constitution that 13 states on the Atlantic coast had created now bind a continent? Was it possible for a whole nation to be get dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal? Okay, so we have a timeline here on the bottom of pages one and two, okay? And I want you to open that up. So these are the two pages. See if you can maybe open them up on your screen together, okay? So you can see the whole timeline there on the bottom. So we've got um, from 1777 all the way until 1875 down here, okay? So, and then we've got a picture here of slaves on the auction block. So, and this is kind of a slavery timeline. So every state north of the Ohio River and the Mason-Dixon line passes laws that severely restrict or abolish slavery. So that happened in 1775. In the region as a whole, however, slavery is abolished only gradually. New Hampshire and New Jersey restrict but do not abolish slavery until the federal government forces it in 1865. So even though 1775 we started having rules, it was almost 100 years before um, a lot of places were actually abolishing it. Um, and the North, uh, so you got 1787, the Northwest Ordinance forbids slavery northwest of the Ohio River for all the future territories and states in the region. 1793, um, you're going to have um, Eli Whitney, who is an African-American guy, invents the cotton gin. Um, and then cotton reigns as the economic king. Everybody's doing cotton. Um, in 1807, Britain abolishes the slave trade everywhere within its empire. Remember, too, we just read the whole, you've been reading about William Wilberforce, or you just finished him. So now this is what Britain has just done with slavery um, and um, importation of slaves into the United States was prohibited in 1808. So let's read chapter one here, Slavery Conquers the South. The Civil War was both the simplest and the most complicated event in American history. It was the simplest because we can summarize the issue in one word, slavery. But it was the most complicated because, as Southerners will say, it was a war between the states. The 11 seceding states, which made up the Confederate States of America, remember that's the bottom area, okay? Um, 
contained 9 million people. On both sides, there were many different kinds of people and many different ways of life. In the North, many did not want to abolish slavery, and in the South, many did. In the North, many people did not care about slavery one way or another, and in the South, many people did not own slaves and did not make their money from slavery. The Declaration of Independence said that all men are created equal. If Americans truly believed that, then you would think slavery had no place in the United States. The puzzle then is how slavery became strong and how some white Southern Americans, even if they did not own slaves, came to believe it was the very foundation of their life. If we can understand this, then we may understand why there had to be a war against slavery in order to save the Union. In ancient times, slavery was found everywhere. When one people defeated another in war, instead of massacring the losers, the winners would often enslave them. They would make the losers serve the winners. Even as late as the Middle Ages, slavery of this type was widespread among Europeans. Beginning in the 1500s and 1600s, however, this kind of slavery was slowly disappearing. But while slavery declined in Europe, it grew elsewhere. Beginning in the 1400s, Europeans began to invade Africa and they enslaved the people they found there. When Columbus discovered the new world, he and those who followed him did the same thing. They enslaved the people they found. Um, so by the time the Pilgrim Fathers sailed, you could find both African and Native American slaves in the new world. So while America meant a new freedom for many white Europeans, for many others, especially for blacks brought from Africa, America meant slavery. The first unwilling African immigrants were brought to Virginia from Africa in 1619, and Massachusetts Puritans began buying and selling Indian slaves by 1637. Indeed, they itched to acquire black slaves. As one wrote the governor of Massachusetts, 20 African slaves would be cheaper than one English servant. So one English servant was gonna cost more money than just having 20 African slaves. Under the old system of empires, the European mother countries wanted from their colonies the things they could not produce themselves. In addition to gold and silver, they wanted products like tobacco, rice, cotton, sugarcane, and indigo, which is a pea plant that makes a deep blue dye. All of these crops grow only in warm climates. The climates of the new colonies in South America and the Caribbean were perfect for these kind of crops. These crops also require lots of labor. Hard work in the hot sun did not appeal to the men who had left Europe for a better life. It was not easy to find workers. The Portuguese in Brazil, the Spanish in Latin America, and the English in North America first tried to solve their problem by enslaving the Native Americans or the Indians. But there were not enough Indians. Harsh treatment, and I've now turned on to page four, harsh work, harsh treatment, exhausting work, and diseases the invaders brought from Europe killed off too many of them. So the Portuguese looked for other sources of labor. They began importing people from Africa. African tribal chiefs often sold their neighbors into slavery or white slave catchers would catch them. These newly enslaved people were then stowed like livestock in ships and brought across the Atlantic. Okay, so this is a um, image of the ships and how people were brought across the Atlantic. Um, and you can see how many people would be shoved into the ships. I mean, it's just not, it's not even um, a reasonable amount of space and they could be in there for weeks or months in these ships. Um, we can hardly imagine their misery, but since profits were high, the slave traders brought these prisoners to the Americas by the thousands. A hundred years before Captain John Smith landed at Jamestown in Virginia, parts of Brazil had 20 black slaves for every one white worker. By the early 1700s, Virginia plantation owners were importing black slaves by the thousands. Year by year, slavery was becoming more important in the life of the colonies in America. Thoughtful Southerners began to worry. Thomas and Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, Thomason, Thomas Jefferson, made up a list of George III's crimes against humanity for the Declaration of Independence. The final item Jefferson included in his list was that the king had encouraged the slave trade. He was waged, cru he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty. Um, Jefferson wrote, Part of the crime, said Jefferson, was the fact that the king did this against distant people who had never offended him. He captured and carried them into slavery in another hemisphere. He caused them to suffer miserable death in their transportation to the new land.
Jefferson himself owned slaves, so you know he was writing a kind of indictment against himself, too. After all, he himself was enjoying the benefit of this crime with which he was charging the king. But the Congress did not want to hurt the feelings of other slave owners or slave traders, most of whom were from Massachusetts and New York City. So they removed these words about slavery before they adopted the Declaration. Jefferson worried about what slavery did to the slaveholder. He exclaimed in his notes on Virginia that every slaveholder becomes a tyrant and his children learned bad habits. The parent storms, the child looks on. The child puts on some airs in the circle of smaller slaves and gives loose to the worst of passions. And so he is exercised in tyranny. In other words, the child is watching the way the parent is treating the slaves and the child is learning how to do this. Um, so Eli Whitney invented a machine that separated the cotton fuzz from the cotton seeds. I apologize. Earlier on, I said Eli Whitney was an African-American man. He wasn't. He was a white man. Um, I had heard some stories that um, there was rumors that an African-American man actually kind of came up with the idea and we, Eli Whitney stole it. I'm going to see if I can find some research on that or if I'm just remembering that incorrectly. This was in 1793 and within just a few years, cotton became the great crop of the South. Slavery became more important as soon as cotton became more important. Cotton growers used slaves to plant, cultivate, and pick cotton. And they used slaves to work the cotton gins. And the most enterprising planters bought as many slaves as they could. That way they could grow and sell more cotton. And when they sold more cotton, they bought more slaves. And slaves became a key to wealth. Southerners soon began to say cotton is king. But cotton was a very unpredictable king. The price of cotton depended not only on the weather and the size of the crop, but also on how much the cotton cloth manufacturers in Birmingham, England, in Birmingham, Alabama, England, and Lowell, Massachusetts were willing to pay. People in the South came to a place, the place where they could not imagine a world without cotton, and it began, became harder and harder for them to imagine a world without black slaves. Every year, the black population, and I'm on the, it, page six now, the black population in the South increased. In cotton growing regions, black people began to outnumber whites. For example, by 1830, blacks outnumbered whites in Eastern Virginia by 81,000. When people in the South began to think about this, it terrified them. Wise men like Jefferson and Madison were convinced that in the end, no one could have a decent life if anybody else was not free. If um, the American Colonization Society headed by ex-president Madison aimed to get rid of slavery by gradually exporting all of the black people to Africa. By 1831, many white people in Virginia were worried about slavery. The new governor owned 12 slaves, and he tried to persuade the state legislature to make a plan that would gradually abolish slavery. Um, the legislature held a great debate on slavery. It lasted most of the month of January 1832. Members offered arguments on both sides for and against. All kinds of suggestions were made. On January 25, the legislature voted 58 to abolish and 73 to keep. Would anti-slavery advocates ever be able to persuade pro-slavery legislators to change their minds? Or would change only come about by force? The British had abolished slave trade everywhere in their empire beginning in 1807. And they abolished slavery itself in 1834, which we just learned about in the Wilberforce story. According to the United States Constitution, 1808 was the earliest time anyone could pass a law that would affect slavery, and the United States Congress wasted no time. It passed, it a, law, passed a law that prohibited any more importation of slaves from abroad, beginning in 1808. But in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, slavery, slavery and trading in slaves still flourished inside the American South. So we couldn't bring slaves from other places, but we had enough slaves in here, and they were having children that we could keep the slave trade going. Foreign travelers who came to the United States were shocked. There were more slaves in the land of the free than in all of Europe. How could a free people tolerate, tolerate a tyranny that the old world had left behind? In the 20 to 30 years after the American Revolution, most Northern states abolished slavery. Remember, the American Revolution is when we fought British, the British to have freedom for our country. Thomas Jefferson drafted the law that would eventually become the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And let's look over at the picture there. So Thomas Jefferson drafted the law that would eventually become the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. The ordinance controlled the means by which new states would be admitted to the United States. Included in the ordinance was the law that forbade slavery northwest of the Ohio River. 
So you see the Ohio River there. Everybody find that on your map on page seven. Land that soon came to be known as the Northwest Territory. This map shows the original 13 states that passed the ordinance, the six states that acquired land from the Northwest Territory, and their dates of admission to the Union. These states' slave-free status contributed significantly to the interesting increasing contrast Americans felt between the United States North and South. So that's the original 13 states in green. And then the new states that came in, okay, um, they, they were not allowed to have slavery. Um, for, they forbade um, slavery northwest of the Ohio River. Um, so he included a law that forbade slavery northwest of the Ohio River. I'm back in the middle of page six. By 1830, of the two million black slaves in the United States, nearly all lived in the South. They made up more than a third of the South's population. As a result, slavery seemed mainly a Southern problem. Ever since the American Revolution, when we fought the British, some leading Southerners like Jefferson and Madison and Chief Justice John Marshall had said that slavery was a dangerous evil. I tremble for my country, warned Jefferson in 1783. When I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. I hope the way is being prepared for a total emancipation. And I hope this will be accomplished with the, cons with the consent of the masters rather than by their destruction. So that the slave masters would agree to it instead of us having to go after them. So why didn't it happen that way with the consent of the masters? Why didn't people in the South settle the problem for themselves? Where there was, there was a number of reasons. Southerners had become accustomed to slavery. Most, perhaps as many as three quarters of the white people of the South never owned slaves and they weren't members of slave owning families. But even still, nearly everyone was tangled in a web of slavery. Free white men did not want to work alongside side slaves. People began to view any kind of hard labor as slave labor. While cities sprouted elsewhere, the South, for the most part, remained a land of farms and plantations. Partly because there were so many fewer cities, opportunities for jobs were scarcer in the South. Very few immigrants came from abroad to settle in the South. Because the South lacked immigrants, it lacked new ideas. Immigrants were often the ones who wanted to shake things up. They wanted to have their opportunity, but no one shook up the South. And then we've got a page here. Um, the next page will be chapter two, but that's the end of chapter one. So just looking at some of these um, questions here, why do you think people enslaved other people throughout the centuries? And what is the Christian view on slavery? So um, I think you guys can understand that the reason we had slaves was so that other people could do the work for us. Um, we accepted it as commonplace. Um, Christianity, the Bible does talk about slavery because there were slaves in Bible times. But as Christians, we believe that all people are equal. And that's actually one of the major things with Christianity is that we view all people as equal, no matter your race, your religion, your creed, anything. We are all equal humans. The book says that some Puritans bought and sold Indian slaves. Why did some Christians participate in slavery? Um, I think, you know, the answer they have here is that slaves were cheaper than servants and they weren't truly following what the Bible said about all people um, being considered equal. So they were misinterpreting the Bible. Why didn't the Portuguese, Spanish, and English just enslave Native Americans? And if you remember, there weren't enough Native Americans. Um, and Africans were also capturing and selling their own people. So that was happening a lot too, where one African tribe chief would ch capture the tribe next to them and sell them. So why was Thomas Jefferson's passage against slavery removed from the Declaration of Independence? So he had this thing he wrote about slavery, but it was removed before they printed it, before they approved it, because they didn't want to hurt the feelings of other slave owners or slave traders. So they left that part out. What did the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 do? It forbade slavery northwest of the Ohio River. Remember that, that was the map we had in there. And that really divided the country in regards to slavery. We had ended up having the North and the South and it really divided us. Um, 
so, um, yeah, I think that's probably it for chapter one. So all you have to do, what I'd like you to actually do, this is actually what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to tell me in an answer after this assignment is done, um, what your opinions are about, obviously, I think everybody here agrees that we don't approve of slavery, but I'd like you just to tell me about what kind of things jumped out at you while you were reading, what, what you didn't learn. I tell you this, let's do this. Give me, give me something you learned that you didn't know beforehand. There was something I, I remember I read and I was like, oh man, I never real. Oh, you know what I never realized before I read this section was the, the difference between these here United States that we were really actually separate countries before we became the United States. That those colonies were actually almost separate countries. And I remember I didn't really re realize that before I read that. So what I'd like you to do um, in, for your assignment for this after you've listened is just send me something interesting you learned that you didn't know before. And if you can't think of anything you didn't know before, just something interesting um, that you got from reading this. And um, that is your uh, assignment for today.